2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12, and the King James text today reads, let me put it on the screen for you, there you go. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, once again for this time, this opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. We thank you, God, for the word of God. Lord, we have a written record. We have promises that we're able to cling to today. And Lord, we have your spirit, your presence, your power that comes down every time two or more gather together in your name. You promise, God, that you're in the midst of us. And Lord, where the word of God is and the spirit of the Lord is mingled with that word, we have truth. Master, in the name of Jesus, let the truth of God today be loosed from this pulpit. We do not need God to hear man-made dogma or doctrine. We need to hear from heaven at this hour. Lord, storm clouds are gathering and it's growing dark and stormy. And we need today more than ever to know that the master is in the ship. Help us today to receive from your word that which you would have us to receive. Anoint not only the speaker this hour, O oh God, who desperately needs you. My body is weak, but my spirit is willing. And Lord, I surrender and yield myself as your vessel today. But touch as well the ear of every hearer, that we might not only hear in our hearing, but hear in our heart, and receive in our spirit the engrafted word of God. For we ask it today in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I grew up in a fundamentalist church. 
Fundamentalist evangelical churches, one of the things they love to do more than anything is scare the life out of you. I don't know if you uh, grew up in an environment like I did, but Johnny, the preachers used to love to just scare the life out of us when I was a kid. Jesus is coming! He may come tomorrow! He may come tonight! Hallelujah! Oh, you better be ready. And I mean, they, they'd have you convinced that the rapture was coming at any second. And my God, you'd better run to that altar and you better weep and cry and snot and booger all over the altar. Because if you don't, then when the Lord comes, you'll be left behind. And yet, interestingly enough, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. <clears throat> you see, Tommy, when the Lord comes, the saints will be gathering together unto him. It's not about Jesus returning to the earth and doing something here. It's about him coming to gather the saints unto him that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Well, my Lord, you just knocked out the whole, uh, you know, the whole purpose of the assemblies of God. Why, their whole message is about shaking you in mind. Their whole message is about making you troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. You see, true people of God need not be concerned, Bill, about the coming of the Lord because we are instructed by the Word of God as to the things that will come to pass prior to the Lord's coming. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not standing up here today telling you, oh, the Lord may come tonight. The Lord may come tonight. You better be ready. No, something worse could happen than the Lord coming. You could drop dead. You could go to sleep tonight and not wake up in the morning. Well, the fact of the business is you've got to be ready under that circumstance as well. Amen. But it's not about causing you to be fearful. It's not about causing you to be troubled. But God's people are informed by the word of God as to various signs that will take place prior to the coming of the Lord. So there's no need for us to be troubled. There's no need for us to run around being terrified that the Lord is coming. Well, first of all, if the Lord's coming terrifies you, you need to get right with God. Because the coming of the Lord shouldn't terrify you. The coming of the Lord should be the best news you ever thought of. Amen. It should be the best thing you could ever expect or you could ever anticipate. But Paul said, don't be troubled. Don't let anything trouble you. Even if you get an epistle, if you get a letter that appears to be written by us, if it causes you to be troubled or concerned, he said, then you need to understand something ain't right. I'm going to tell you a little secret, folks. Something ain't right when the church you go to preaches the coming of the Lord as a means of scaring the life out of you. That's right. Something ain't right when the church you go to and the preacher you're listening to uses the coming of the Lord to try to scare you into the altar. Something ain't right. Amen. First of all, they're not preaching a true message. The Apostle Paul continues and he said, Let no man deceive you, listen, by any... For that day shall not come, shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and, so it's not just about the fall. Oh, I remember as a kid in church, they used to love to preach about the falling away. Oh, the Bible said before the Lord comes, there'd be a great falling away. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Um, it also says, and. That means with the falling away, something else is going to transpire. What is that something else? And. Uh, that man of sin be revealed, 
the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple, showing himself that he is God. This speaks today of that figure we know as the Antichrist. The Word of God tells us the coming of the Lord will be preceded by two things. Number one, it will be preceded by a falling away. Number two, it will be preceded by the revelation of the Antichrist. Before the church is called out of planet Earth, the Antichrist will be revealed. Now here's the interesting thing. In recent years, we have seen church people willing to follow one of the most ungodly, evil, wicked human beings that has ever walked planet Earth. A man whose reputation is so vile and so disgusting, and everybody that knows him knows exactly what he is. And yet we've seen preachers tout him as the great hope of the church and as a representative of Jesus Christ. We've seen this in recent years. Oh, I'm going to tell you folks, uh, I used to wonder how in the world it would be that so many would fall away from the truth of God and so many would be deceived by the Antichrist. I used to wonder how in the world that could even happen until 2016. All of a sudden it became painfully obvious to me. Oh, it isn't hard to see, Bill, that the Antichrist is easily going to slip in. And many in the church are going to choose him over the truth of God. Many are going to choose him. Listen to what the word of God says. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. See, it's merely a matter of timing. There's an hour appointed when the Antichrist will be revealed. And we're just waiting for that. Well, I got news for you, children, today. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Uh, we are getting very close to that hour. I told Tommy the other day, I said, you know, there are right-wing lunatic fanatics rising up all over the earth right now. And if you look at the political atmosphere in our world today, it literally looks like we are winding up to repeat everything we saw prior to World War II. Mm -hmm. Well, now what's interesting about that is if we're seeing things winding up to repeat everything that led up to World War II, would that not suggest to you that just maybe... We're getting geared up for World War III. Mm -hmm. I got news for you, children. There ain't going to be but one more war. There ain't going to be but one more world war. And then this whole thing is over. We are literally seeing people rise up in our world today. Leaders rising up in countries around the globe. Using the same identical tactics used by Adolf Hitler. I said when I saw a certain political campaign in 2015, I was perfectly willing. When Donald Trump announced his candidacy, I was perfectly willing to see what he had to say. I told Tommy, I, that's one of the reasons I think I get so mad these days, because I'm like, you know what, you jackal, I actually was willing to give you half a chance. I really was. I, I was as fair as anybody can be. Anybody wants to stand there and say, oh, well, you had made up your mind ahead of time. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I was willing to see what he had to say. Now, I wasn't going to vote for him. I wasn't going to vote for a Republican regardless, but the point is, 
I was willing to see, you know, Johnny, hey, most Republicans who come out of New York City are very, very moderate. If you look at former uh, New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg, Mike Bloomberg is a very moderate Republican. Most Republicans in the history of New York, period, whether it be New York City or New York State, are very moderate Republicans. So uh, they're not really that hard to swallow because they're pretty decent. You know, they're uh, generally, they're supportive of the LGBT community. You know, they're not uh, rabid dogs about certain issues like a lot of Republicans are. So when Donald Trump first announced his prison, I knew the man had a reputation for being a crook. You know, I, I knew that. But I was like, well, let's, let's see what all he says. Let's see how he represents. But the minute I saw the campaign, I was troubled in my spirit. I mean, I didn't hear but one or two blips of him on television, and I was very troubled. Let me tell you something. Any feelings I have about that man have nothing in the world to do with what MSNBC or CNN or anybody else tells me about him. Any feelings I have about him are because of the garbage I've heard come out of his own mouth. And I watched his rallies, and I saw the way he was operating, and I said to Tommy, and I began to make memes for the internet, I said, my God, this man is literally using Adolf Hitler's playbook, and this is not hyperbole right now. I am being as serious as a heart attack. I said, if you look... At every famous quote from Adolf Hitler, you will see everything Donald Trump is doing. Adolf Hitler said, for instance, that hate is more powerful than dislike. So if you notice, Donald Trump tried to make people hate his opponent. Hillary Clinton. It wasn't about saying, well, I'm the better choice than she is. I'm better qualified than she is. I can do the job better than she can. No, 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 no. It was constantly throwing accusations at her, constantly accusing her of being corrupt and being vile and being evil and being all these things. And you'd see the crowd just stirred up into a frenzy. Lock her up! Lock her up! You would see all this negativity <clears throat> and all this bitterness and this hatred being thrown at her. And I thought, well, there's Adolf Hitler. Hate is more powerful than dislike. Adolf Hitler said, a leader of genius knows how to lop the enemy, I'm, I'm, I'm not quoting him, but I'm paraphrasing. To lop the enemy all up into one big ball. And you just make this one big ball, and everybody that you consider an enemy, you just throw in this one ball. And all of a sudden, we have Mr. Trump telling everybody that the Democrats are the enemy. The Democrats are against our democracy. The Democrats are trying to take our government over by a coup. The Democrats this. The Democrats are for open borders. The Democrats, the Democrats. And all of a sudden we see that everything negative, everything evil and wicked is being associated with either the term liberal or Democrats. Adolf Hitler said, make the lie big. Said, and just keep repeating it over and over again. Said, because people will believe it. Doesn't matter how big a lie it is, people will believe it if you just keep repeating it over and over again. We've seen this man tell fibs that, it, that those of us who know anything about anything are sitting there saying, well, that's the biggest crock of nonsense that ever was spoken. But he keeps saying it over and over and over again. We just saw this last week, we just saw in the impeachment hearings, 
We saw experts on Russia and the Ukraine say that this whole uh, storyline of the Ukraine being involved in uh, uh, intervening in our elections, you know, that this is a crock of nonsense. It's a bunch of baloney. That it was clearly the Russians who were involved in interfering in our election. And they're the ones who have started this storyline in order to deflect attention away from them. They're the ones who started the storyline that it's the Ukrainians who were involved and crowd strike and blah, 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 blah. And this woman, Fiona, what's her name, said, uh, you know, don't believe this. This is not so. Said, please don't keep perpetrating this falsehood. And Johnny, she no sooner stops, the minute she stops saying those words, Republicans began to repeat that same crap over and over again. Donald Trump the next morning called Fox News on television and he was perpetrating that same lie again. Because nothing is going to stop them from telling the lie, the big lie, over and over and over again. Again, because they've got people in their crowd who believe every stinking word they say. And as long as they keep repeating it, these people will keep believing it. I've never seen anything like it in my life. I could go down a list a mile long of Adolf Hitler quotes. I'm not kidding. I, 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 I don't want to take up time today doing it, but I could go down a list a mile long. And, and his campaign and his presidency has literally followed Hitler's path to the destruction of the German Constitution to the letter. I want to tell you a little secret today. If that man gets reelected, which I don't believe he could legitimately be reelected, re but I don't think he was elected legitimately to begin with. So that means if he could get in the first time illegitimately, I've got news for you, I'm afraid he's going to get in the second time illegitimately as well. And if that happens, folks, we are in trouble like you cannot begin to believe. I said... And I'm not trying to preach politics today, but this has to do with my message. I said before he got into the White House, I said, if that man is allowed to step over the threshold of the White House, our democracy is as good as over. I've been praying like a house on fire. I went into my prayer closet last night and I was praying. I said, God, please, Lord, preserve our democracy. Please, Jesus. Intervene on behalf of our country. But I'm not sure that that's in God's plan. I've got news for you folks. This country's done a lot of evil things. This country has engaged in a lot of wickedness. And it may very well be that we're simply reaping the rewards of the seeds we've sown. It may very well be that judgment has come. And this is part of that judgment. I used to wonder how in the world people of God would fall away and people would fall after the Antichrist and they would believe on the Antichrist. Now I don't have a problem understanding it at all. The problem is we live in a world today where people are wanting to follow after religion, they're wanting to follow after a relationship with God, but they want to do so on their own terms. We've gotten to a place where people don't want to live for God on God's terms. They don't want to serve God on God's terms. They don't want to worship God on God's terms. No, we want to do it on our terms. Got news for you, it doesn't work that way, folks. The Word of God tells us today in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, This know also, the Apostle Paul wrote, that in the last days, perilous meaning life-threatening times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, 
boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, meaning without self-control, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Listen, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. This description that we read in 2 Timothy is not a description of the condition of humanity in our world as we approach the last days. It is a description of the church as we approach the last days. Having a form of godliness does not apply to the world. The world isn't even trying to have a form of godliness. But Paul said all these people with all these attributes will have a form of godliness. They're going to have a form of religion. But they will deny the power thereof. They will deny the power of a relationship with God. They will deny the power of living for God. They will deny the power of walking in fellowship with God. You see, the truth of the matter is, if you walk in relationship with God on God's terms, oh honey, there's power. I'm going to tell you, you start doing things God's way and you will be shocked at what begins to unfold in your world. You will be shocked at what God begins to do in your life. But when we try to live for God and we try to walk with God on our own terms, things do not work out nearly as well. We live in a society, we live in a church today where people are wanting their relationship with God to be on their terms, not on God's terms. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, I was raised in the Pentecostal church. I have watched the church decline over the last 40 years. I've literally watched it just go backwards. I recently heard that there is statistically fewer and fewer and fewer people are receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In Pentecostal churches, fewer and fewer people. Now, when I was a kid, my God have mercy, people were receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost by the thousands. Our church used to grow and grow. Well, the church I grew up in grew by leaps and bounds, partly because of ministries on television like PTL. Praise the Lord with Jim and Tammy Baker. You can say anything you want to say about Jim and Tammy back in the day. I know Jim's gone off the wagon and he's about as nuts as they come today. But back in the day, you can say whatever you want to say about Jim and Tammy Baker. But they believed in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They preached the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They used to have preachers on PTL like uh, Brother C.M. Ward and others. Uh, R.W. Shambach, great men of God who preached the Holy Ghost baptism. I'll tell you, Joel Osteen's father used to preach the Holy Ghost baptism. You never hear a sermon today come out of Joel Osteen's mouth that even begins to refer to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I've never heard Joel Osteen even allude to the baptism of the Holy Ghost in one of his sermons, but I won't tell you a little secret, his dad, that's about all he ever preached. You go online and look up Joel Osteen's father. You go online and look up John Osteen and you see, look at the sermons he preached. Every one of them, every one of them he talked about the need for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. John Osteen had been a Baptist preacher for many years, and then he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and it blew his world and his walk with God wide open because all of a sudden his walk with God was no longer on his terms. 
It was on God's terms. You see, you cannot yield to the baptism of the Holy Ghost without accepting God's terms. Because it's all about yielding. It's all about surrendering to God and letting God have His way in your life. And it is impossible to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost without yielding to God's terms of service, as it were. You know, a lot of websites and a lot of programs you use on your computer, when you go to use them, they say, well, first you got to agree to these terms of service. And you got to click that little button, you know, that little area. you got to put a check mark in there and hit OK before you can even use that program. And if you try to bypass that page and use the program anyway, it'll just bring you right back to that page saying, no, sir, you got to agree to these terms of service first. And I tell them the truth. Well, I got news for you. To receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you got to agree to doing things God's way. You got to agree to letting God lead you and letting God guide you and letting God direct you and letting Him be the one that determines the direction you take and the way you do things. And a lot of people aren't willing to go there today. And they say, statistically, there has never been fewer people receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost than there are today. Well, of course, because people have a form of godliness... But they're denying the power thereof. In Acts 1 and 8, the word of God said, But ye shall receive power when after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Oh, in the last days they're going to have a form of godliness but they'll deny the power thereof. Where does the power come from? The power comes from the Holy Ghost. And they don't want the Holy Ghost. No, we don't want the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost takes control out of my hands and puts it in God's hands. And God forbid we go there. Last night I was struggling with my allergies as I have been now for a number of weeks. And I mean, it's been terrible. It's been just so terrible. I can't even sleep at night, folks. I mean, uh, literally, I, I'll, I'll try to sleep. I'll sleep a couple hours. I'll wake up, you know. I come out into the living room, and I was on my, my laptop for a while and watching television. And I got tired. I said, I'm going to go to bed. I'm tired. I'm going to go ahead to bed. And I began to head to bed, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me said, it's time for a prayer meeting. Johnny, I was tired. I was ready for bed. I was, that's where I was headed, was for bed. I, I wasn't headed for a prayer meeting. I was headed for bed. But the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my spirit and said, it's time for a prayer meeting. Oh, I'm going to tell you, when you got the Holy Ghost, I've had this Holy Ghost in my life for a lot of years, ever since I was a kid. When the Spirit of the Lord speaks to your spirit and says you need to do something, I'll tell you a little secret. You, you have to be pretty foolish and pretty rebellious not to surrender to the will of God. I couldn't say no. I, I couldn't tell the Lord, no, Lord, I'm too tired. I just need to go to bed. We'll, we'll talk about this in the morning. I'll have a little prayer in the morning. No, I knew that I needed to get in that prayer closet. I knew I needed to find myself alone time with God and I made my way to the prayer closet and I got down on my knees and I'm going to tell you I had a marvelous wonderful 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 time of prayer in the presence of God but you see this Holy Ghost will cause you to do things on God's terms you don't do things on your turn. When the Spirit of the Lord said, it's time to pray, it's time to pray. I don't care if you're hungry. I don't care if you're tired. I don't care what, what you think you want to do or how you think you want to do it. When the Spirit of the Lord gives you a divine directive, you cannot help but yield to that. Because you know that your power comes from the Holy Ghost. See, I'd be a fool to try to operate 
on any other terms than God's terms. I'd be a fool to try to operate on my terms. I'm going through a lot right now. I've got a lot going on in my body. I don't understand what God is doing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, I'm not going to stand up here and act like I know what God's doing. I haven't got a clue. I haven't got a clue. Sometimes I say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. But I know this. I know I trust you. I know the word of God said, but we know, we know, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. I know, God, that I can trust you. I know that whatever you're doing, you're doing for my good. Even if I wind up in a box underground. I got news for you, honey. I believe there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Death ain't scary for me. That is a promotion. So I'm not worried about that either. The only thing that troubles me, to be honest with you, when I think about it, I worry more about y'all. I worry more about people that uh, I'm trying to minister to. I worry more about doing the work that God's called me to do. I worry more about Tommy and what he'll be stuck with than I do about what uh, what's going to happen to me. I'm not worried about where I'm going. I know where I'm going. I've got my ticket. I'm ready to go. Amen. I've been living for God on God's terms. Amen. And as long as you're walking with God on God's terms, honey, you haven't got a thing in the universe to fear. The Word of God tells us today in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, Paul writes, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We got preachers today, some of the most popular preachers in our world. I mentioned one a few moments ago. I went to the website of Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. I could not tell you, as a theologian and as a preacher of the gospel, I could not tell you what kind of church Lakewood is. I can't even tell you. I looked their entire website over, and their website doesn't say one stinking, blinking word about doctrine. It doesn't say one stinking word about any specific belief. I said, how in the world... Uh, you're not operating on God's terms when you cannot even articulate specifically what you believe in any given area. You see, that is what doctrine is. There's a lot of people out there, I love people who call themselves Christians and say, well, bless God, we don't need doctrine. Um, yes, you do if you're going to do things God's way. Yes, you do if you're going to operate under the power of the Holy Ghost. If you're going to walk in the power of God. The Apostle Paul said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You better have some defined terms for what you believe. You better be able to define exactly what you believe on any number of areas. If you ask me today, do you believe in the Trinity? I can answer that question. If you ask me, do you believe in the oneness of God? I can answer that question. I can define it for you. If you ask me today, do you believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance? I can answer that question. Yes, we do. When I first came back to God, after having been out of church for a few years, I called the local MCC in the city that I was living. I heard about this church that was, you know, created for LGBT people and, you know, and I said, well, maybe that would be something I'd be interested in. Who knows? I called the pastor of the local MCC, Bill, and I asked her, I said, do you all believe in the Trinity or, you know, 
She said, huh? What? This is one of the biggest cities in America. And the pastor of an LGBT affirming church literally could not even tell me whether or not they believed in the Trinity. I said, okay, well, let me move on from there. I said, uh, what do you preach concerning salvation? Huh? What? Uh, I'm not sure I know what you mean. I said, what do you preach concerning what a person needs to do in order to be saved? Well, I'm not sure I understand your question. I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. I said, lady, thank you very much, but you're churching for me. And I hung up the phone. And I never, ever stepped foot in that church. Because if you can't define what you believe, if you cannot, if you don't have enough of an understanding and a revelation of God's word to be able to, to define to me whether or not you believe, you know, how you define the Godhead, how, how a person must be converted, what it is required for a person to be saved. If you can't even answer those questions, my God have mercy. Heaven help us if I asked her if she believed in the rapture, her head would have probably blown up. <laughs> and yet today we have LGBT people all over America and around the world going to these churches. I saw a message some while back from the moderator of MCC. And they were literally asking, listen to this, they were literally asking ministers around the world to write in and give them some idea of what they felt would be a doctrine of MCC. I was like, what? You're asking the grassroots to tell you what, as a denomination, you believe? That ain't how it works. Leadership is from the top down. Moses didn't ask the people of God to tell him what they ought to believe. No, Moses talked with God and came back to the people and said, Here are the commandments. This is what you need to believe. Am I telling the truth? But we've got an entire, and I'm not trying to besmirch MCC. I understand they've done a lot of good work. I understand they've helped a lot of people to at least, if nothing else, re-enter into some walk with God. I have some, hun. Thank you. Um, you know, I understand that. I'm not trying to say they've done no good and none of that. But I'm trying to tell you today, folks, you cannot walk with God on your terms. You cannot define for God the terms of service. God defines for us the terms of service. If you preach the word of God, there will be times when you're going to reprove. Reprove means to correct, to set right. There are times you're going to say, folks, uh, this ain't right. Let me, let me show you what is right. Let me show you how we approach this the right way. You're also going to have times where you rebuke. I'm going to tell you, we got people that are not in this church this afternoon because this pastor rebuked. And they didn't like it. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I've been in the Pentecostal church my whole life. I've had preachers look me right square in the eye and rebuke me because I was doing something or saying something I shouldn't have been doing or shouldn't have been saying or doing something the way I shouldn't have been doing it. And I'm going to tell you, say, I didn't turn like a little sissy and put my tail between my legs and run out of the church screaming and crying. No, if you earn a rebuke, then you need to deal with that rebuke. If it's the Word of God, if that rebuke is based on the Word of God, then honey, you need to accept it means maybe there's something in God's terms of service that you're not honoring. You're not quite doing things the way you ought to do. <clears throat> See, when you preach the Word of God, it's not all about sweetness. It's not all about cherries and whipped cream. It's not all about ice cream. It's not all about sweetness and pie. And yet again, we have preachers in our world today. 
You never hear them correcting anything. You never hear them get up there and say, folks, there is a doctrine loose in the church today that is not accurate and is not right. And, and I want you to be informed as to what is right. That's reproving. You never hear them getting up and saying, listen, we got folks in this church who are doing this and doing that or preaching this or teaching that and they know that is incorrect and we're not going to have that foolishness going on in this church. No, they don't reprove. They don't rebuke. No, because that's not how you build your church. That's not how you draw the numbers. But that is how you operate on God's terms of service. Because the Apostle Paul said, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, their own desires. This has nothing to do with sexuality. People read the word lusts in the Bible and immediately they go to sex. I got news for you. Very seldom is that word used in the King James and it has anything in the world to do with sex. It simply means after their own desires. That's all that term means. Shall they heap to themselves teachers? having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. People want religion in their life, but they want religion on our terms. I'll tell you, there's a reason why our church isn't as full as First Church down the street. It's not because we're not preaching the Word of God. I told Tommy the other day, he and I were having a conversation, and I was thinking, and, and uh, as I often do, and I said to him, I said, you know, when you really listen, because I'll listen to our messages, you know, online and stuff, and I've listened to some of our older messages and some of our more recent messages, and I told Tommy, I said, boy, I'll tell you one thing. Anybody wants to try to accuse our church of just preaching a, a feel-good message, anybody wants to try to accuse our church of just preaching what sounds good in order to pull people in the door, they sure aren't listening to our sermons. It's like, I'm going to tell you something. This preacher don't preach our terms. I strive to preach God's terms. Amen. I try to preach the power of God. I try to tell people what the source of power is. And the source of power is not man-made religion. The source of power is the Holy Ghost. I said, well, I'm going to tell you, I've listened to a lot of our messages and any accusations anybody ever try to make about this preacher or this church... They're so far off of their rocker, it's not even funny, because they're not listening to what comes off of this pulpit. I'm going to tell you, I'm not afraid to stand before God. I'm not afraid to answer to the Lord for what I've preached and what I've delivered to the LGBT community for the last 26 years. I'm not afraid, folks. Got news for you. If God called me home tomorrow, I am not concerned about the message that I've preached from this pulpit. I know that I can say, Lord, if you gave it to me, I preached it. And if I had people curse me and cuss me, and I've had it happen, and walk out the door because they were mad, then so be it. I didn't change my message in order to appease people. I didn't change my message in order to fill the building. I've tried to be faithful to the Word of God. I've tried to be faithful to the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because that's where the power is. Acts 4, 20, uh, 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. In Acts 6 and 8, the word of God said, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did 
great wonders and miracles among the people. Oh, I'm going to tell you, we got folks today that want a form of godliness, but they want to deny the power thereof. Folks, I'm going to tell you today, you're on dangerous turf. You're on dangerous territory. The Antichrist is in the wings. I got news for you, children. The Antichrist is in the wings. All you people who thought that the teaching and the preaching of the Antichrist, that this was some distant, far distant future figure, I got news for you. He is not very far distant right now at all. He is much closer to making his debut than ever he has been. Trust me, he is very near. I keep waiting. The one thing I keep waiting for, and then I'm going to close. The one thing I keep waiting for is an announcement from Israel that the temple is going to be rebuilt. Because the Antichrist has to make an entrance into the temple. He has to enter the Holy of Holies and he has to declare himself to be God. Well, he can't do that, Bill, if there's no temple. And there's only one temple. See, it's there's no you can't build a temple in America and call it the temple. No, because the temple, as defined by God, is located in a very specific place in Jerusalem. And it has to be in that specific place. There's been some debate over the location of the Temple Mound that you hear about today where the the uh, Dome of the Rock Mosque is located, you know. And there are some who are now saying that Herod rebuilt the temple for the Jews, but he did not rebuild it on the original site. There's some debate about this now. And they believe that they've actually discovered the original site of the temple. Well, guess what? If that proves to be true then the temple could be rebuilt tomorrow because the issue of the Dome of the Rock wouldn't come into play. If it proves to be true that this other site in Old, in old Jerusalem is the actual location of the original temple, then my friend, the temple of God could be rebuilt tomorrow. We are on the precipice. We are on the cusp of the unveiling and the revelation of the Antichrist, folks. And if ever there's been an hour when God's people need to serve God and worship God and live for God on God's terms, it is now. We cannot afford to be believers. We cannot afford to call ourselves Christians and try to possess religion on our own terms. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.